Varnish is a reverse proxy web accelerator written in C and designed to improve the HTTP performance by using server-side caching. In this video, I'm going to go through how Varnish works. We're going to spin up a Varnish Docker container and uh, we're going to set up an HTTP and an HTTPS Varnish configuration. And finally, as always, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of this tech. If you're new here, Welcome, my name is Hussein, and in this channel we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload a new video. With that said, let's just jump into this varnish. This is what I'm going to discuss. First of all, I'm going to talk about just normally the classic HTTP architecture without any caching. Then we're going to insert varnish and see how it does, what actually it does. Right? So we're going to talk about how varnish works. Then we're going to show up some demos where we it will actually set up varnish so spin up a docker container with varnish i have like a postgres database a little bit of an express application that i've built and uh, we will insert varnish on top of that and see how it performs right and then we're going to do the same thing but we're going to use since varnish doesn't work well with https out of the box we're going to insert an https tls terminator in front of varnish to protect our traffic because you know http is alone is bad right you don't want to send your traffic just as pure http so you want to encrypt it with https so we're going to talk about how we're going to do that and then finally we're going to talk about the pros and cons of this beautiful tech so let's just jump into it so a classic architecture is this here here's uh let's say i have a server here that is running on port 215 Okay, it's an HTTP server, and uh, assume that this is not GS, for example. And we have a database for 5432, probably this is Postgres, right? And uh, you have some sort of a pooling, connection pooling going on in the back end. Guys, if you want to know more about connection pooling, I'm going to reference a video here. So, so essentially, the Node.js is connecting to the database, the Postgres database, and, and querying any requests right so that's that's what it does right I'm sending the sql queries so the client will send a get request right to the server and you you might have seen what happened right so the get give me all employees uh the route will hit the node.js application here or any application really and that will translate into a sql query to the postgres database and then that the SQL result will give you a result as an almost an array or a data set, and then that will be translated to a JSON and sent back to the client, right? And if another client has made the same exact request, you will do the same exact thing. Boof, boof. You're gonna hit the server and the database all the time, right? And it, you can see that how expensive this gets, right? You're hitting the server and you're hitting the database, despite the data didn't really change, right? That's that's essentially the limitation that we have here we're overloading the server there is memory being allocated there is cpu cycles being wasted did that just rhyme i'm amazing man the the postgres database there is also obviously uh, the cpus of the database there is the the crunch that is happening in the back end, right? Depends on how expensive the query is. So everything <laughs> actually matter, right? So if you you want to minimize the the load on these guys as much as possible, meet varnish. So varnish, what it does, like if you make a request, the same thing. You insert the varnish. It's a it's nothing but a glorified reverse proxy that does a lot of stuff, right? Reverse proxy, if you don't know, is as a proxy that makes the request on your behalf, right? And hides the identity of the server from you or as, a, as a user, right? So I know we made a video about reverse proxies versus proxy. I'm gonna reference it here if you're interested, guys. But you would make a request to Varnish. It says, hey, Varnish, give me employees. And you would hit the Varnish will make the request, right? So they say, hey, I don't have the employees, I'm sorry. So Edmail will make the request to the server and at the server obviously will just propagate the result to the database and then we'll get the back the results right so let's repeat that see see what happens here right so you see that three of them hopefully the blinking actually works but yeah so the the varnish will, in this case will cache the employee's result get back the results and then if you make another request it will only hit the cache it will not bother the server because it nothing changed and there is a complex 
cash invalidation happening on the back end here? How do you know that this actually changed or not? It's a very complex system to build. We may have mentioned that Lawrence in this case happened to be running on 8080. So if, if another client made another request, just give him the results, right? So Varnish plays here as a reverse proxy and it also plays as a load balancer, which is amazing, right? Sweet. So how Varnish works? As we described, it works as a layer seven reverse proxy. So what does that mean? Why did I insert layer seven there? Layer seven, because it's an application reverse proxy. So it works at the application level. And guess what? If you're in an application level, you have to look at the data to understand what's going on, right? Because while we're caching, right? If we're caching something, we're looking at the HTTP content, it cannot be encrypted. I cannot cache encrypted stuff. It's useless, right? So what do we do is basically varnish design is works only in HTTP, unencrypted HTTP, right? So that sounds scary, but we're going to get to it, right? So, so that's why I said layer 7 reverse proxy and not layer 4, because you cannot really do much caching in layer 4, right? And I'm going to reference a video between layer 7, layer 4, load balancers, and, and proxies for you guys interested to watch that video. How does it cache? It cache by default anything that is Git request. If you make a Git request, it will look at the, okay, Git requests are very uh, semantically it's cacheable because it's item important because they are safe, right? And we made a video so about the get versus post. I'm going to reference it here, guys, so you can just give the idea of what's the difference between get and post. Where unlike post requests, they cannot be cached because they are not quote unquote safe, right? It can also prefetch documents and say, hey, you just made index.html. Most of the time, if you made index.html, you're going to request main.js, you're going to request main.css, you're going to request these images. So I'm going to, hey, I'm going to cache them. I'm ready for you, babe, right? Whenever you're ready, okay? And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about front end and back end here. And we're going to be clear about it. The, the back end, anything behind, Varnish is called the back end here. Okay, I know these terms are very overloaded, these two terms. But anything behind Varnish is back end, anything in front of Varnish is called the front end. It doesn't have to be a browser, right? It's just, it could be another like uh, HTTP ser HTTPS server like Nginx or, or Caddy, right? Or Hedge. All right, let's show some demo, guys. So here's what we're going to build. I have here. Uh, a Postgres database running on port 543 TS, a Docker instance, with an employees table, that, the, the same example we gave. And I have a Node.js application that basically have an endpoint to get the employees, list of employees, which translates into a query to the Postgres database. And we have built exactly what, what I'm describing. I'm not going to go through the code, guys. So if you're interested to just know how this works, I'm going to reference a video here where we built this thing from scratch. We spin up the Postgres database for in Docker. We spin up Node.js and we wrote the code, uh, JavaScript, and do all that fancy stuff to communicate with these two code. What I want to do is I want to insert a varnish. I'm going to spin up a Docker container and then I'm going to configure varnish to point to this guy because it doesn't know, right? You And that's happening through what is called the Varnish configuration language, I think, VCL. That configuration language is very rich and you can do a lot of things in the language. And one of the things you do, or well, most important thing is, where is your backend? You tell your Varnish what's your backend. And we're gonna talk about that, okay? So what will happen essentially, if you make a get request to the employee, and we're gonna get back the results, okay? Sweet, and any, and new request will only hit the cache. So let's just jump into the code. All right, guys. So here's the Node.js application that we have promised, right? And uh, here is the endpoint. It's running on port 215. And this is on running on my machine, which is called Hussein Mac. That's the endpoints called employees. So if you make a request, right, it goes to this server. And this is the output on the back end on the server itself, which is on my machine, right? But essentially, every time I request, I get the, all the employees back, 
right? And I want you to pay attention to this timestamp. I intentionally added a timestamp every request comes, I print the current date, right? So every time I refresh, you can see that, hey, we printed the table, which is this is the which is where we return to the client, and we also printed the date and time. So you can see that it's, uh, so you can see like every time I refresh, this increase like 32, right? Then 35. 36, 37. It's so like every second I can, I, I'm, every time I refresh, I'm going to hit the database. So that's without varnish, right? So I'm going to leave that here and I'm going to show you just here if I go to more tools and I go to developer tools here and I'm going to refresh, click here and you can see see, it's powered by Express because that's what I'm running on, okay? So that's the response header is going to tell you where it's coming from. And it's obviously, obviously it is HTTP, just pure HTTP 1.1.1. Let's insert Varnish. So how do we do that? So what we're going to do first, we're going to spin up the Docker container for Varnish. That is not hard. The second step is going to, we're going to write the VCL configuration, which is the default configuration that points us to Hussein Mac 215, forward any request, any HTTP request for coming to Varnish to my Node.js server. So let's do that. All right, so as always, you have to have Docker installed. The moment you can say Docker and you get some output or you can do Docker, hello, Docker run, hello dash word. That means you have running, you have Docker running. Obviously, I, that's the first time I run hello word. If you see like, hey, hello from Docker, you are good to go, right? That's that's essentially what you need to get Docker. Once you have Docker, you can do all of my tutorials, essentially, all cr crash courses. I run, I rely on Docker because I don't want to pollute your database with, with garbage, right? You can install software and just uninstall it and just Docker and stop the container or remove it, right? It's just very simple. All right, so what you want to do is basically do docker run, and as always, give your container a name. I'm going to call it Varnish, okay? And that's the name of the container. And uh, I want to expose the ports, right? So the ports that is running on this container by default is going to be port 80, right? But I want to expose port 8080 as we explained in the demo, right? I want to expose Varnish to my host as port 8080 but this guy is essentially what is running locally in the varnish container so i want to map port 80 to port 8080 to the public and when i say public i mean my machine okay and then finally it's really easy all you have to do is just do varnish okay and then when you run this puppy you're gonna download if it doesn't exist and we're going to start the Docker container immediately, okay? So I'm going to kill the Docker container immediately because I want to start working and on writing my VCL file. And then the next step is when I'm going to copy the VCL file, the Varnish configuration language, the, the that configuration that tells me, hey, point any request coming to Varnish to the employee's endpoint, which is running on port 215, remember? So how do I do that? So let's go ahead and create a folder called Varnish here, just to put my stuff in it. I'm gonna call it Varnish, right? I'm gonna create a vim default.vcl. And here's how you do it. So the first step is you're gonna insert and uh, you define the language version, vcl 4.0, okay? The next step is the backend, right? What is your backend as Varnish, right? And we talked about backend, right? And my backend is essentially, it's called default, right? And that's very, it looks very JSON y, but it's not really JSON. Very similar essentially to HA proxy, if you guys watched my video there. And then what you do essentially is say, okay, my backend host is called what, guys? It's called the same Mac, right? But that's not enough. What is your backend port? My backend port is called 215. And then you end up with a semicolon. I didn't do any of those. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And we're ready. Quit, write, Q. And you can, by the way, write it in any language. I just want to be fancy and write it with Vim. Okay, just to show you that I'm fancy and I write in Vim. You know, a lot of people do that, right? So I just want to fit in with other people that write in Vim. Okay. 
I'm joking, guys, by the way, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> okay, so here's the default VCL. So next step is I'm going to copy that guy, right, which is in my machine, obviously, into my Varnish Docker container. So how do I do that? So you do Docker copy, and I love Docker command line because it's exactly very similar to the Linux command line, okay, or Unix, okay, I don't want the mob going after me. Okay, Docker copy. And then you say, what do you want to copy? I want to copy default.vcl. And where do you want to copy it? Okay, you want to copy it to which container? It's called Varnish. That's where we called it. You can call it, you can call it anything you want, right? And then you add a colon, and then the path here is called slash Etsy Varnish. Okay. And that will essentially copy that file into the varnish. And remember, the container is stopped. So what do we do? Docker start varnish. We're good to go, guys. So Varnish is running on what port, guys? 8080, remember. So now if I go to my browser and I say Hussein Mac, 8080, all right, that will point me to Varnish, and Varnish will point me to what? To Hussein Mac 215, which is running the Express Node.js application, which will hit the Postgres database, which is another container on my machine. So many containers. All right, so this guy still works, obviously, and every time I refresh, I hit the timestamp, obviously, here, right? That, that, that just shows me that, hey, you just hit the database, okay? You just hit me as a server, okay? So if I go here and I say, Hussein Mac, 8080 employees, the first time I hit it, I got, you can see that there is a time, right? But subsequent request, this, this guy doesn't change, but you get a request. How powerful is this, right? So that I, I can refresh all day. Right, this is hitting varnish, and varnish is caching the JSON response, which is what eight items, okay, and it's gonna stay there, right, until someone make a change to the database, right. And I notice like if I insert a row in the database, varnish kind of lags behind, and it still gives me the old copy of the JSON. So it's like eight employees, but if I add another employee, right, that employee is not refreshed immediately in the cache because how would how would varnish know you are responsible manually to to invalidate the cache some of the time sometimes varnish does some of the things to 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 kind of invalidate the cache but essentially if i go here i can refresh all day it's still 18 right but go to 50 to 15 refresh 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 every time you refresh this guy's changed that is amazing, isn't it, right? If I go here, refresh, 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 refresh. Sweet! So that's essentially Varnish in a nutshell, guys, okay? So, Hussein, this is unencrypted. This is dangerous. Not secure. I do not like this. I cannot use Varnish insecure. How do I secure my Varnish? Make me secure it. How do I do this? Well, you can insert something on top of Varnish that is secure -y, right? Is that even a word, right? There is a, it's, a, it's a basically secure, and that will forward the request to Varnish, which will forward the request to your backend server, okay? You can obviously do that. So let's just jump into it. All right, guys, so we have set up an, an insecure HTTP Varnish setup, and it was very easy as you guys saw. It's not hard, but... How do this do the same thing, but as a secure backend? Now, I want to secure my architecture, okay? So what we're gonna do here, a lot of people use Nginx and put it as a TLS terminator. It's a game, a reverse proxy that has HTTPS support in it. And what we wanna do here is, that reverse proxy will make the request to varnish as an unencrypted HTTP request, right? And so you can do that, right? So this guy, in this case, I'm gonna use Caddy, all right? Which is a beautiful web server, and we made a video about Caddy, I'm gonna reference it here. So I'm not just gonna use Caddy as just an HTTP2 secure server, web server, I'm gonna use it here as a reverse proxy, and yes, you can do that. So thank you, Matt. Matt was the author of uh, caddy so there's a lot of features in this beast of a software man so what we're gonna do here is essentially we're gonna make a request so as a client you do not know any of these guys anymore right 
you just hidden reverse proxy guys the definition of reverse proxy you hide the identity of the server you don't know any of these guys anymore you know this puppy that's only what you know you make a request like the first request it will hit caddy right obviously there will be an, a tcp communicate uh, multiplex tcp connection between the client here right so that's pretty fast right but this guy in the back end this will be http1 because this guy only support http right varnish only support http guys that's you have to know that right yes the new versions of varnish support https as similar thing where you, they add another extra layer but varnish itself has to be http because it needs to look if you need to look it has to be unencrypted okay so if you know you have that and you're gonna hit the node.js server and you have the database right so one one thing here before we jump into this demo guys you might want to wonder is like what if this in my cloud was what if this was in my cloud you're forcing me to use my back end is not really on http hussein it my back end is https maybe, maybe you have nginx here running and varnish on top of it well varnish doesn't support https back end yet right in an open source at least in the in the varnish plus which is the paid software the varnish can make https connection on the back end right that feature is missing in the open source you, you cannot make an https request to an encrypted backend so let's just jump into it and do this guys so four layers of system right so there's a lot of stuff and as we discussed this is called the front end this is called the back end okay how about we do this setup so up until here we have all of that setup we have this guy we have this guy we have this guy so what we're missing is just this guy all right guys so what we need to do is going to spin up a caddy web server and that caddy web server has to be pointing to my varnish setup right which is running on port 8080 what we need to do is first we're going to write some configuration to do that the second thing which we already i already did on the background is you have to make caddy run on port 80 and on port 443 and you have to register a dns name right my dns name is called myhost2.dns.net okay that dns entry which is registered in no ip points to my public ip address which is now which is which is which is running my router obviously and my router is mapped to my machine which is hussein mac okay i have done i'm not gonna do this in this video because i've done it in the caddy video so if you're interested to know how to set up an http2 secure web server go watch that video i'm gonna reference it here okay so that i'm gonna assume that i have done that obviously okay so what we're gonna do here is like let's create a folder called make directory caddy red and then let's go and then what we need to do is create a caddy file very similar to a vcl language right it's like so i'm gonna use vim because we're fancy all right and then called caddy file has to be capped capital letter c okay and then when you create that file here's what you're gonna write my host is called my host 2ddn s dot net and then again looks very json -y, but not really so what we need to do is essentially proxy anything that goes to caddy into what into my local machine which is 127001 or local host or say mac on which port the varnish port right i want everything that goes into port 443 or 80 through caddy to go funnel through port 8080 and then we're gonna just save and we're done so clearing the screen once now i write caddy what will happen here is caddy will detect there is a caddy file on the in the same file it will start listening on port 443 and it will start listening on port 80 and that's my website now guys this is a public website. If I give you this, you will hit my server. So I'm gonna, I try, I'll, I'll remember to disable that after the video. Okay, let's talk about a little bit before we jump into it, right? So this guy is pointing to my router, right? This DNS entry pointing to my router. My router has two rules, port forwarding rules, 
AT and 443 ports are forwarded to my Hussein Mac machine on port 443 and port 80 where Caddy is listening. And Caddy have a rule that says, hey, any request that comes to you on port 443 or 80, please forward it to the same local host machine, which happens to be Hussein Mac, on port 8080, which is Varnish, and then Varnish will do its magic to talk to the Node.js Express application, which is running on port 215, and then 215 will point to the Postgres database, which is running on port 5432. Wow. <laughs> Let's see how it works. All right, so my host.dns.net Right, let's add HTTPS because we're fancy like that. Right, and then slash employees. And you can see, and you can see that we're hitting that, but the database is not getting hit because it's being cached by Varnish. Coolish stuff, guys, right? So this guy is the public one. It's the HTTPS secure. All right, guys, so let's go through all these layers now. The first layer is Jose Mac 215. That is the Node.js application, okay? So if I refresh this, every time I'm going to hit the database, obviously, there is no cache, okay? If I go to developer tools and I record, you can see that I'm using HTTP 1.1 because it's unsecure, right? That's the only thing we can use when it's unsecure, okay? If I hit this guy, look at this. The response header, it's only express. That makes sense because Node.js is the is the thing powering uh, this application that's running on port 215. Let's go one layer up. This is Varnish. If I do Varnish now, Varnish is a reverse proxy that talks to the Node.js application. So let's, talk, let's take a look what happens here. Record, still using 1.1 because that makes sense. It's, still, it's not really secure. If I click on employees, what happened? Response header, it adds the varnish header via, okay? Because it adds the via, and it's just like, hey, this is a proxy, but it's like, hey, you're communicating to me, to, to the server through me, right? Still a reverse proxy because I don't know the server. I don't know the, the IP address of the backend server, okay? The Node.js is, is hidden from me, kind of, right? Well, I know it's running Node.js because varnish actually added those requests back as a result right and just it, it told me that hey veya it came it came from me by the way so that i tried to add that that header for you and that's the back end express server essentially okay and it adds also this thing which i don't really know what what it is there has to be some some caching mechanisms all right let's find the final thing here guys the final thing i am running caddy right so what will happen here is when I record, no, this guy is H2, beautiful stuff. And if I click on this guy, look at that, a response header, three layers. First, the server is caddy, right? Because that's the application that you're communicating with, right? But it went from caddy through Varnish, and from Varnish, it went and was powered by Express. So you can essentially see the entire stack in the headers and that's because varnish actually rewrites the header adds stuff changes stuff that's one of the features of uh, uh, of uh, varnish because it's just basically it's a reverse proxy and proxies can change the headers if it is a layer 7 proxy which it is right all right guys let's go back to the slides and talk about pros and cons all right guys varnish pros and cons is this technology perfect no Nothing is perfect in life, right? So let's discuss the pros of this technology. So the first advantage, there's a lot of advantages, man. That's good stuff. So the first advantage that clearly it's the caching and prefetching of documents, right? So unlike Redis, where you as a developer responsible for caching stuff, this actually caches on your behalf. Kind of double-edged sword, right? Because you don't, you have control, right? Stuff, but sometimes you don't, right? You don't know what happens, whether varnish cached or not. There's unpredictability, and this is kind can get scary, right? So a lot of people use Redis because of this, right? I want to cache my stuff my own way, right? If I want to make a request, I'm going to cache that stuff 
only if I need to, right? And I'm going to invalidate it only if I need to. I'm responsible, right? A lot of people like the control here in Redis. But if you just want things to work magically, use Varnish because it will cache for you. It will prefetch documents. Let's say, hey, I'm going to uh, request the index.html. But hey, index.html will also pull these images, will also pull, pull these JavaScript files, main CSS, PDFs. I don't know. So we don't have to bother the backend servers and the database, right, with the request if I have all these documents. So I'm going to go ahead and prefetch them. Resolving DNS host name and documents. So if you're like fetching an index.html file, HTML sometimes posts to a URLs, right? And this URLs, whether links, whether uh, images, or JavaScript files, anything, right? These doesn't necessarily point to your same domain. They point to multiple domains, and that could be expensive to to resolve the DNS every time, right? So what what Varnish does is the moment it starts, it caches and resolves the DNS names every request comes in, right? And it remembers the DNS IP address essentially it matches the host name back to an IP address, all right? That could be also a double-edged sword where, hey, you're caching to one IP, but what if I have my DNS set up as a kind of a load balancer, like a high availability? I want my DNS to point to this IP sometimes. I want it to point to this IP sometimes. If you use Varnish, then it's always going to point to one IP address. I realize I'm talking about the disadvantage in the same time I'm talking about the advantages, but... Yes, it's beneficial because that extra UDP request to get the DNS, which is not really much if you think about it, but saves you milliseconds. A few milliseconds can add up if you have a lot of DNS, right? Especially if you're flooded with DNS requests, right? So having one central place to, to make all that stuff, resolve it in documents can speed up things. Rewrite script to optimize code. I haven't seen an example of that, but that's what they claim they do, varnish, right? So like if there is a complex JavaScript code, okay, that can be written in a more optimal way, they will do that for you, right? On the, oh, like you're requesting a document and they know like, hey, you're writing it this way, but we can rewrite it to do this way, giving the same output. A little dangerous. But they do that, right? If there's something unnecessary, they will optimize the JavaScript again because they can look at your data. They can look at everything you're doing. So Varnish, if you're really worried about security, you got to really think hard about Varnish, right? Because if Varnish was exploited, you're done, dude, okay? Because it's everything is cached. Your data is cached, right? So, yeah. Same thing with the layer seven load balancing. So speaking of layer load set, load balancing, yeah, Varnish supports that because it's a reverse proxy. It's built in the features of reverse proxy where it can act like a load balancer if you want it to. So you have like you make a request to Varnish. I'm gonna have three backends, right? In my case, in my demo that I did, I had one backend, but you can have two. Nothing stopping you from adding two backends, right? I should have done that, I think. But it's really easy. Just spin up another Node.js and literally just add, add an extra line in the VCL to point to the extra backend, and you're done. So yeah, doubles at the load balancer. Backend connection, I didn't talk about that, but this is powerful stuff, right? So this is comes back to the multiplexing. It's not really multiplexing, but I like to call it that. So what happens here is, when Varnish starts, you say, hey, okay, there is a very similar to a shape proxy, by the way. You spin up Varnish and it says, hey, my backend is AMB, right? I'm going to go ahead and establish TCP connections to my backend, right? Just to get ready to execute stuff. And it knows it can do this because it knows it only supports HTTP on the back end. But yeah, so they establish a pool of connection and every request, if required, only it will hit the back end using one of the pool of connection and you can set up how many connections and and all that and all that jazz right you can set up how many 
maximum connection in the back end and all that stuff right so yeah it's like and the, and the connection can be busy and and all that stuff right so yeah but it only support http and the back end right the varnish plus i think supports https if you add like an ssl equal true okay if you have the moment you enable that ssl parameter if you have varnish plus if you paid for that software you can make requests on the back end that are secure right if your back end here when i say back end is whatever behind varnish is https by default varnish open source will not work with it you have to have varnish varnish modules that's a powerful stuff so you can extend your varnish with mods essentially right to do stuff say hey make a request what do you want to do i want to rewrite the headers which varnish does by the way the rewrite headers as we saw like it adds the vea header it uh, it can also add other headers if you want to right it, you can you can write your own v mods to do very fancy stuff like enable post request caching if you want to like because you know varnish caches only get requests because they are safe right and uh edge side includes that's a very interesting one and very very modern stuff right this edge side includes all right and um i don't know if you guys heard about this concept of edge computing but essentially varnish plays very important role in this thing and and cloudflare if you heard about this big content delivery network they heavily cache pages based on this right and if they cache these pages they can guarantee better uh delivery to your cl clients essentially right instead of having to go always go to the back end server to pull a piece of content like a document or a javascript file they can cache it and here's the problem though with caching pages you know their pages is not always static this is not 1991 okay it's not everything is a marquee script and a flashy images right it's it's more fancier we have dynamic pages we have personalized pages like if i log into a page the page will show up personalized it's like hello hussein hello john doe hello jane doe hello whatever right but the rest of the page is almost static right sometimes it changes right so what they said okay obviously you cannot cache these pages anymore because they are different right right if, if there's one text that is different the whole page is different so what do you do you cache every single page where every single name that's absolutely useless right you cannot cache the pages you will end up caching all essentially every single permutation of the page because, just because i say hello john or hello hussein or well, hello ali right it's the same thing right so meet edge side includes edge side includes essentially i'm gonna i'm gonna in the video as a b-roll showing you an example of how it looks but the whole page will look the same the part that changes you mark it up with a special markup language called esi right which is called the edge side includes so you say hey edge esi include name whatever first name right you say something like that right and if you did that the whole page can be cached because now it's all similar right but it's still hussein you're not gonna return first name to the user here's the thing here's the varnish who does varnish will take the content and and we'll, because it's cache, it didn't have to go back to the server because hey, it looks the same thing, right? And it will look at the ESI include page, okay, the include markup, and it will replace it with the dynamic content, right? Powerful stuff, guys. I recently learned about this. This is powerful stuff, right? I know Cloudflare is doing it you know with edge computing and all stuff some people do fancy stuff on the front end and the edge when i say edge here this is is this is essentially caches http accelerators proxies right before hitting the back end you write code i think they call it workers or something like that web workers i think that's what they call it okay so web workers that generate esi and replace content on the fly right so you still get the benefit of caching the page but you can change dynamically is this perfect no sorry since varnish is a cache 
we're going to give this first disadvantage. Nobody can escape this. Cash invalidation. It's the hardest problem in computer science. It's a big claim, but I am willing to say that. In my 15 years career, this bug was the hardest to find of them all. Every time we spend five days debugging a bug, it's because of cache invalidation. Every time. They are very nasty. Very nasty. And I'm talking from databases layer, from server layer, from anything really. Right? At all stages, this is the nastiest thing. Cache invalidation. How can I guarantee that the cache is no longer valid and i want to invalidate it because it's something changed the data has changed it's a very hard problem to solve some people solve it with the cache right through and all that stuff but redis you have more control over this thing that varnish there are tools that allow you to invalidate like purge and ban and, and uh, what they call the other thing as well I forgot what it's called right they, they you can you can essentially invalidate think time to live right you can you can you can you have tools to invalidate stuff but still it's very technical very difficult right so you have to be very careful about this cache invalidation if you don't really care if the user is served a little bit older content eh but sometimes like if a tweet has been deleted and varnish still returning it that can be nasty right so you gotta be careful with this. If you delete, maybe you wanna just go ahead and purge that. Okay. That's the there's the purge method that actually purges that content for you in varnish. All right. One of the disadvantages only works on unencrypted HTTP, at least on the open source version. I know that I'm not talking about here. The whole presentation here, guys, doesn't talk about the of the paid software. May have more features, but the open source version only works on HTTP and it has to right because it has to look at the data to cache it otherwise how does it look how does it do it right so if you have if you have a, a secure website you have to at certain point unencrypt send it plain text to the varnish software so it cache it and then if you want to you can encrypt it back Obviously, this is not supported. The backend HTTPS for Varnish is not supported in open source, at least for today, like in November 2019, it's no longer supported. It's not, not really supported. But if you if you think about it, you can you can play some tricks. You can insert another layer, like a reverse proxy backend that is insecure, communicate with Varnish, and then yourself may like insert an NGX at the back end, but you end up like inserting a lot of layers. At that point, it just kills your performance, right? So for HTTPS front end, right, you can terminate TLS. Well, we have to terminate TLS, right? The moment terminate TLS, whether you use Caddy like we did, use NGINX or Hitch, which comes by default with Varnish, I think, as it's like, as a separate layer, right? Hitch proxy is a HTTP2 proxy, and then caddy is also HTTP2, which always has to be HTTPS, right? By default, HTTP has to be like that, right? So yeah, in the front end, you gotta terminate the TLS so you can send unencrypted stuff. And that's by itself very scary, right? Because that layer now, if someone sniffs between varnish and the TLS terminator, they will be able to see your content, right? And similarly to the backend, especially in a cloud setup, that stuff is dangerous. For HTTPS backend, there's no solution as we talked about in Varnish open source, right? Unless you're using Varnish Plus, I think it's called, which supports HTTPS connection to a secure backend, right? By default. By default, open source doesn't support it. Okay. Well, we talked about we can you can insert another layer, a secure layer on the back end, but that, that's still useless if you think about it because you just transmitted HTTP, plain HTTP for a while, right? And then you end up securing it. It's just useless. All right. Can't cache post request. Well, that does make sense because 
Post requests are not cacheable by default because the HTTP standard says, hey, post requests is not item potent. They are not safe because they change the backend. That's the semantic of HTTP. But here's the thing, guys. Remember GraphQL? We made a video about GraphQL. And GraphQL always uses post, even for queries. And there's a reason for that, right? Because GraphQL, by default, sends a huge QL payload, right, to the server. And guess what? In Git, right, it cannot use Git for that because Git has a limit, right? Because Git doesn't have a body, so it has a limit because everything is put in the URL parameters and if you put everything on the url parameter you have a limit of 2000 characters or 2000 bytes right that's why graphql uses post only for normal queries so guess what varnish is useless for you if you are using Gra graphql if you put varnish in, in front of graphql you varnish is absolutely useless out of the box because it's going to pass all that request to the GraphQL anyway. So you didn't cache anything, right? Well, that can be mitigated by writing a mod, varnish mod, that actually caches certain post requests based on certain attributes. But that's hard to do, right? Because how do you know what post request you should cache or what post request that you shouldn't cache? Well, that's a challenge, but you can do it. It's just hard to do. That comes back to why people prefer to use Redis and have full control, full responsibility on the caching versus things that can, eh, yeah, it's like you put something online and you hope everything is cached. That's not true, right? You have to know how this stuff works, guys. And we talked about this. If you have, like, a, you invest in a beautiful backend HTTP2 and it right, everything is secure, right? And then you have this you use HTTP two, and you said, "Hey, let's insert varnish in the in the in the front end, like in the in the front of this, and so we can a little bit cache that stuff." Nope, nope. You just lost that. You just lost the benefit of HTTP two. The moment you put varnish in front of an HTTP two server, you lost HTTP two. You don't have that anymore. You have to communicate pure. HTTP with the server, which obviously downgrades your server to HTTP 1.1, right? Which is not as fast as HTTP 2 because HTTP 2 is multiplexing, right? That can be debated because, first point, Varnish Plus support SSL connections on the back. And so I'm not sure if whether Varnish Plus supports HTTP 2 as a client to a server that supports the GDP2. That point, I'm pretty sure they do, but I did, I ha well, in my research, I haven't seen that explicitly written, so I'm not gonna say anything of that. Yeah, so that's one point. The second point is, well, how frequently are you gonna hit the backend anyway? Let's like, think about that, right? Varnish is gonna start caching stuff preemptively, right? If it caches stuff preemptively, then, that's good stuff, right? It doesn't really matter. It's not like the client is waiting for Varnish to make that request for it, right? That's just the one time, but as, as Varnish start caching stuff, that won't be a problem anyway. But just be aware of it. Be aware of this stuff, guys. There's a lot of stuff. Summary, long video, guys. I know, I know. But essentially, we talked about classic HTTP architecture, right? How just normal stuff works. Have a web server, a database. You make a request to the web server. That, that web server makes a request on its behalf to the database, right? And then gives you back the results. We insert varnish and we beautifully were able to cache requests that look similar. Obviously, varnish has this algorithm, right, that does, does that. Right, we also set up an HTTP varnish, like this is a pure HTTP setup varnish configuration. And we also set up HTTPS varnish in, as in the front end because we couldn't do it in the back end because guess what? Varnish doesn't support back end HTTPS as long as, as again, November 2019, it does not. It only supported on uh, Varnish Plus, which is the 
the paid version, right? So we, we did a caddy, we put caddy on front because a beautiful thing instead of Nginx, just spice things up. Like. We put it as a TLS terminator and we, took the, we talked about TLS termination, guys. I'm gonna reference the video if you're interested, guys, to know about that. And finally, we're gonna talk about the pros and cons, guys. So what do you think? Are you gonna use Varnish? What project are you gonna use Varnish for? Leave your thoughts in this. So let's have a discussion on the comment section. It's like, what team are you on? Are you team Varnish, where install and forget about it? Or are you team ad hoc cache like Redis, where, hey, I want to have full control of my cache, essentially. I want to have full control of my cache, and uh, I want to cache anything I want, not just HTTP requests, right? I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome.